Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Fertilizer helps plants grow. Today, we're going to show you how to make sure you apply the right amount. Also, sod is a great way to start a lawn or just fill in some holes. Today, we're going to show you how to lay it. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Celeste Scott. Celeste is a UT Extension agent in Madison County, and Booker T. Lee will be joining us later to show us how to lay sod. All right, Celeste. Okay. Fertilizer mixing, and guess what? Math <clears throat> is involved. Yes, lots of numbers and math Man. when we're talking about fertilizers. Darn it. Oh, got it. Hey, math has to come in handy somewhere, right? It does, but you know, it's not hard math. Okay. So we're doing some basic, you know, junior high math skills, nothing too difficult. Okay. We're going to do a little division, a little multiplication, and, and we're good to go. So. I think I can handle that then. <clears throat> All yeah. right. So, what do you want to start with this? I see you have fertilizer here. Oh, yeah, we got several places okay. we can start. Okay. You want to start with uh, talking about the parts of fertilizer? Let's do that. Okay. Well, your um, fertilizers are going to have three numbers that are denoting what type of fertilizer they are. Okay. That's known as the fertilizer analysis, okay? So, for example, 3400 is the bag I have right here beside me. <clears throat> the first number is the amount of nitrogen that you have okay. in that fertilizer. The second number is your phosphorus. The last number is your potassium. Right. And a lot of old timers know potassium <laughs> is potash. potash. So yeah. it gets a little confusing <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> when you're talking about that. People think phosphorus is potash, but it's not. So we've got yeah. nitrogen first, phosphorus, then potassium. N, P, and K. N, P, and K, for mm -hmm. short, if right. you wanted to sum that up. Um, it is called the fertilizer analysis, but it can also be looked at as um, a ratio or a percentage. So these numbers are telling you the percentage that's in this bag of each um, ingredient. Okay. So 3400 has 34% nitrogen mm -hmm. in this bag, and it's got 0% phosphorus and potassium. <clears throat> For example, um, there are some other types out there that people may be familiar with. We have on the table here, triple 13. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at that in a ratio form, that would be a one to one to one okay. because all three numbers are the same. Right. Um, so you've got 13% nitrogen, 13% phosphorus, 13% potassium. Um, and hopefully I've described that well enough to make sense. No, that makes sense. Yeah. One to one to one ratio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now... So we have triple 13, or we have, how about 15, 5, 15? Okay, let's start with that. So if only 45% of 15, 5, 15 is actual fertilizer, what is the remaining portion? Okay, so the remaining portion uh, that's not talked about on your fertilizer analysis, um, that is going to be what they call inert material. Right. It's a filler. It's usually gonna be made of uh, clay, or something organic, you know, in that form that that fertilizer is is able to be mixed with, and um, you would think, well, I'm getting cheated. I'm not getting all I paid for it. Right. <clears throat> but really, it does have a few purposes. Um, it number one, it um, helps owners be able to apply it more uh, efficiently, okay. get better coverage, and it also um, prevents over-application mm -hmm. of fertilizer. So uh, farmers buy fertilizer in bulk and mm -hmm. that doesn't have filler in it. Um, bagged fertilizers are going to have this inert material okay. and it just makes it more efficient for homeowners to be able to use it properly. Okay, inert ingredients inert. is pretty much what you see on the bag. Yeah. All right, so how about this one? What's the difference between complete versus incomplete fertilizer? Okay, well, we have some perfect examples. Okay. The 3400 that we talked about, that would be considered an incomplete fertilizer because it only has one ingredient. It doesn't have all three ingredients in the fertilizer, mm -hmm. okay? Now, um, anything else that has a number in every one of those slots would be considered a complete fertilizer, like a triple 15 oh, right. or 
15, 15, 15. People shorten it yeah. for short and say triple 15. Or the triple 13 that we have on the table as well. Those would be considered complete, complete. fertilizers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are also some other ways that you could categorize fertilizers. You could categorize them in, as, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as slow release or fast release. These both would be considered a fast release fertilizer. They're going to release their nutrients over a two to three week period, mm -hmm. and they're usually going to look kind of like crushed up rock, you know, just for a general appearance. Mm -hmm. um, slow release fertilizers are in more of a, um, it's called a prill. It's a small, smooth, round right. um, type ball. Um, <clears throat> and those are going to release their nutrients over a two to three month period. Okay. So, like Osmocote. Right, like right. Osmocote okay. would be considered a slow release. And uh, they make it in large bags as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a lot of different options and different circumstances call for slow and, and some you may want to go ahead with fast release. So those are a few different ways that we can um, divide fertilizers up into. And you could also go um, water soluble yeah. or insoluble. A water soluble fertilizer would be something that's uh, in a crystal form, mm -hmm. kind of like miracle Grow okay. that you can pour into water and it goes into solution. You can water your plants with it. So that's a few different ways that you could talk about fertilizers. Okay. Now let's definitely talk about this while we have a little time left. <coughs> Organic sources of N, P, and K because you know, of course, a lot of folks want to grow their vegetables organically. So let's right. give them some organic sources for okay. N, P, and K. We definitely have sources for organic nutrients. Um, the only issue with that is usually they're going to have less of that right. nutrients in them. So you will have to use more okay. of it okay. than you would synthetic fertilizers. Um, they're also a little more expensive, but we've got a couple examples here. This first one is blood meal. Hmm. <clears throat> this would be a source for uh, nitrogen, okay. organic source for nitrogen. This particular one here, I think has 12% 12, 12 nitrogen. Okay. So obviously that's not even half of the right. synthetic 3400, but it's available. Um, also, here we've got bone meal. Mm -hmm. That's a good source for phosphorus. Okay. It does have a little nitrogen in it as well. This particular brand has 2% nitrogen, 14% phosphorus, wow. and 0% potassium. Okay. So it's mainly a phosphorus source. Right. <clears throat> now the the third ingredient, your potash or, or potassium, I don't have an example of it here, but that would be uh, products that are made from uh, seaweed or kelp or even um, burnt wood ashes. Mm. You can get um, some nutrients in the form of potash in that way. They're usually going to be between 4 and 10 percent okay. <clears throat> active ingredient in those products. Um, so they are available and on the market. Okay. Again, these are your organic sources. Mm -hmm. So these do work. Yes. Okay. And yes, they are good. Mean. Yeah, and they're good. I mean, this is what folks used, mm -hmm. you know, before we, we had synthetics. So if you are trying to uh, promote organics and, and try to go in that direction, you can definitely do that with those products. All right, Celeste, we appreciate that good information, and you're going to be with us next week to show us how to apply these fertilizers. Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Right. Chill hours. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's typically referring to the number of hours below a certain cold temperature that is required before fruit trees or any are will flower mm -hmm. and, and bear fruit. It not could be just fruit tree, it could be a flowering plant. You know, I think um, like for example the Encore azaleas. Okay. You know, they kind of bred that out of them because they don't know they, they, not, they don't have the chilling requirements as much anymore. They just bloom sporadically right. throughout, you know, the season. But the chill hours are typically used to describe fruit trees. You know, like peach, you pick your peach variety or your apple variety based on where you are because if you have, if you have a cultivar that let's say has a certain number of chill hours, and those chill hours are met. Let's say it had to be just arbitrarily 30 hours below 40 degrees, okay? Yeah. And you had this peach tree and it all of a sudden you get that requirement met and it's too early mm -hmm. and it blooms out too early. So then what's gonna happen? It's gonna get nipped by the frost and it's gonna kill the flowers. 
So that's why chilling hours are, are very important oh, for people who grow fruit trees to know they're picking the right cultivar <laughs> with the right chilling requirements so that they don't bloom out early and the blooms get killed. And that's what happens sometimes when the Bradford pears mm -hmm. and some of these other things bloom really fast in the spring and you think, what's it blooming now? Well, the chilling hours were met. They'll be blooming at Christmas. You're going, what's that stupid thing? It's crazy. <laughs> well, the chilling hours got me. All right, so Booker, you're going to show us how to lay side. Yeah, we're going to see how to lay side. So how do we get started with that? How do we get started? The first thing while we get while we land this side now, oh, we had a friend house. He want to lay some side. Okay. And he started off, he's been here about 20 years now. Okay. And he, he had Bermuda grass down here. Mm -hmm. And over a period of time, you see, he got some big old tall oak, oak tree. You know, right. oak tree now. They was probably bit the house. They were real small. He had Bermuda grass mm -hmm. down here. And over a period of time, the grass began to die. And now he want to go with a, with a new grass. Okay. And we know that uh, Georgia grass would do good in, in partial shade. But we found a new one, raw right. Georgia. Okay. It'll do good in, it'll do good in, in, uh, in shade. Okay. So he go with a, a raw Georgia this time in here. But before he got started, the first thing he did, now he kicked everything out of here. Okay. He got some round up and sprayed everything. Whole yard. Whole yard. Uh, ton of, ton of brine. <laughs> kid. Then he came back in with his garden tiller and tilled it up. Okay. Then before you get started doing everything, another thing, don't till it when it wet. That's because right. those hard panels get in there, it's hard to break up. Okay. So you want to make sure it's dry. Then once you get it tilled, you want to you want to rake it out. So I got it right here. We're going to show you this. Rake it out real smooth. Move it out real good. Oh, you want the soil to come in. You want to come in contact with some good loose soil, for the soil can catch on real good. Okay. See how you doing that? Right. A lot of work doing that. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> you want to, muscle work. So you want to level it out real good, real smooth. Then you want to come in and uh, lay your soil. But another thing we did that he did a soil test. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Good. And the soil test came back. His pH was kind of low. He needed to add some lime. They told him to add a. Um, a uh, hundred pounds for one thousand square feet. Okay. But you don't want to do all that at one time. Now you want to do probably about thirty pounds at a time. Then come back in and do it again once the grass catch on and start growing real good. All right. Dr. Cooper, now you, you, if you see sun, it's cut a certain way. Now we don't start right here because we don't let you no. Know, when you give it late sun, you got some sprinkle heads out there. You got a thing. <laughs> you need to make sure you mark those out like you got right here. You got them sucking around there. All right. Because we didn't know that was a sprinkle head. That's right. You, you don't want to go out there and cover it up. up. <laughs> you, you ain't wondering why you're not doing any good. <laughs> now you see sod on this ridge here. Now it cut a certain way. When you buy sod, it cut a certain way that it fit in. If you want it to fit in, it would be real good. They go together. Okay, so you gotta butt it up. Butt it good, up. Huh? Yeah, see that real good. Like that. See that? How I butt it up. Don't lay another one here. Make sure you butt it real good. In there, you look at it. That's where it go. See that look real good in there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now we're gonna stop here and come back when you're laying inside. You don't wanna make sure that you don't have the sing right there. See that sing there? You don't want the sing. You don't wanna lay it like that. Right. Because the sand going to get when it rain, it'll wash up. Yeah, you can see the water channels. Water channels get in there. So you want to come back. Not only that, weeds to grow in between that, yeah, too. Weeds gonna, you want to come back just like that in there. And come on down because you want to make sure that sod is uh, tight together. So, then you come back in here again. You make sure you find the right edge, but then put it real good together. Hope we ain't got another sprinkle head down there. <laughs> oh no, if it is, it's covered up. It's <laughs> covered up. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you know you might keep it regular in there. So it's got to be right, right? You said right smooth. Real smooth. Good contact is what good you're looking contact, for. Right? Good contact, good contact. In there, so that look good there. How'd it look? Look good so far. Have you done this before? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so oh, you know what you're doing, huh? You know what we're doing there. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you come in, you did all, all kinds of odd job and catch it in there. So. We just watch those in the end and make sure they go together. Right. That's where they go. Yeah. Now, Booger, if you flip this up, man, you can see it has a real good root system in there, too. Oh, yeah, it did real good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Real good root system in and, there. And another thing, when you buy sod, you know, you don't want to lay on the pallet too long. Okay. Try to, when you have it to ship, at least in two or three days, try to be able to put it down. Right. You don't want to set that, because we are dry. Now, we are doing this in the summertime. 
I mean, it's real, real hot, and it's been real dry. What you want to do, you want to water down some. Okay. But, but the roots don't want to get into no hot, hot soil. All right. Not wet now, <laughs> kind of moist. Moist, moist it down real good. Yeah. So we'll come here again and lay another one this side over here in there. Just to make sure. And it's, I see how they look looking there. How, how they look? Oh man, it's looking good, man. Huh? Are you for hire? You looking good, man. Oh yeah, man. Anytime, man, you just about money, man. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we, we working together there. It's so in there. So that look good there, so. But while you're doing it, how long do you think that's gonna, you know, take hold? Oh, it'll catch hold and uh you will see it catching hold real good. It keeps some moisture on there. Mm -hmm. You don't want to keep it. You don't want to keep it wet. Okay. Keep it kind of moist until it start catching on. And you can come out. You can come out here and, and pull on it. It'll be a caught on. Okay. If it's hard to come up, that means it's it mean, like, taking root. Catching good? roots. Okay. Mm -hmm. no, no, you know what? I'm getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good though. You know, that's a good exercise. So we got it down there real good. See that? See that there? You see, now that don't go together. Right. You see how I look? Uh -huh. You can tell it don't fit like that. See, they, they, so, no, that don't fit together. See, you see that big gap you got there? Yeah, that's too big a that's gap. That's too bad. No, do, right. what, what I do, I turn it around. Now, see, that, see the difference? Fit. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. huh? See, when you lay inside it, they don't go out there and get it and put it any kind of way. Because it won't look good. <laughs> you got to <laughs> fit it like a puzzle. Like a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right now. You know it's that, like don't you? <laughs> I'm going to read this out right here a little bit here. Okay. Cause that, that's kind of hot here. Can you hold it for me a minute? You don't mind? Oh, yeah. Hold on. I want to read that out there a little bit. Yeah. It's just kind of mud out here right now. A little not too much. I'm glad we didn't do a whole lot <laughs> right now. So that, well, that, that, that might be good something to show that too. <laughs> now, but we get this laid. When you get this side laid, all of it laid real good. You want to roll this here. Okay. You know, for it to fit in real good together. You know, we got a roller. We can roll it out and make sure it come in contact with the, the ground real good. Okay. Then so you, you want to get it even when you're rolling it. You want to get it even when you roll it, yeah. You want to get it even when you roll it to make sure you kind of get everything together. Okay. And I think they look pretty good. To make sure you, the most important thing, don't have these seams running together. Have those seams, add those seams, split. Kind of lap like a pull, like you said. Okay. You want to make sure you do it like that. Okay. I think they're real good, don't you? It's a good start, right? When you get through, man, you don't have a pretty, pretty yard in there. So I think that's where you do that in that side. Two things you need to keep in mind. Do your soil test. Right. Because the, the, the lime is the most important thing. If the pH is off, it's not going to take up the other nutrients in the soil. Okay. So you want to make sure that you are. Uh, so what does the lime do to the it, pH? It really helps the other okay. fertilizer be used up by the plant. Okay. The grass wouldn't use the other, pH, the other soil if the pH is off. Okay. So you make sure you do that soil test. And he did his soil test, came back low, like mine did. <laughs> <laughs> and he got, it, he got it fished in there. All right, then, Booker, we definitely appreciate that demonstration. Okay. Can't wait you. to see what it looks like later on in the season. All right, then. All right. Okay, I'm going to show you how to properly plant a hosta and hopefully protect it from voles at the same time. The first thing when you get a hosta, you want to dig the, your hole about twice as wide as the container. Then loosen this. You don't have to go deep, about three inches or so, and incorporate some good organic matter. Hostas are not deep-rooted plants. Then right in the center of your prepared area, you want to dig out just like a cone shape like this. Okay. And we're going to take a product, this one, there's Soil Perfector, there's Mole Go, there's a whole bunch of products out there, and just dump it right in the hole like that and make it, pack it up against the sides like this. We're going to get a little bit more there, get in there. Now what this does gives you a protective barrier because when the voles are in there, they don't have any place to push that. So we're going to make this cone like so. Then we'll remove this hosta from the pot just like this, spread the roots out a little bit, force it down in the center, and then we're gonna come back again with a little more on the top of it, like so, to protect the pip, okay? Then bring your little light mulch on top of it, the hosta's done, and you got pretty good protection against voles. All right, so last, this is our Q&A session, so let's see what we have, okay? okay? Here's our first question. Why didn't my daffodils bloom this year? Mm -hmm. Typical question we get this year at the Extension Office. Three things come to mind. For me, number one, not enough sun. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, not enough sun, number one. Number two, they cut the foliage back too soon last year. Maybe their husband got a little antsy with the lawnmower? Got, maybe. And just, and just went ahead and just, ran over? Just ran right over. <laughs> and so you need those leaves because those leaves are going to be collecting nutrients for next year's growth. Mm-hmm. So just let those leaves stay there until they start turning yellow, they're mm-hmm. going to brown out, then they're going to die out. Then you'll be fine. But yeah, if you cut them back too early, it's going to be a problem. Or the third thing is this, crowding. So if you those bulbs been in the ground for a long time, they're going to crowd each other out. Mm-hmm. So you have to dig them up, separate them, put them back in the ground. Share them with a friend. Share them with a friend is something yeah. else you could do, right? So Fellow they can bombers. have some of your beautiful daffodils the next year. Mm-hmm. All right, so those are the three things that come to mind to me. So if you do those, you'll be just fine. Yes. But yeah, but don't cut the foliage back. Don't yeah. do that one. But yeah, divide them if they're crowded. Make sure it has full sun, you'll be fine. All right, here's our next question. What is wrong with my azaleas? They don't grow. (laughs) The leaves look weak, I fertilized them, but they just look anemic. And this is from Mr. Joe. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that one? Well, Joe, there's (laughs) several things that could be going on there with your azaleas. We'll just start at the beginning. Start at the beginning. They may be planted too deeply if they're okay. newly, you know, a new um, planting. Right. So because they're shallow rooted. They are for the most part. And they like good drainage. Mm-hmm. They don't like to be in really wet sites. So making sure that the crown of the plant, you know, is above the ground level there would be important. I All would right. think for me. Ah, right, that's good. That's um, good. Also, it the location. If they're in a sunny location, um, it's going to be more conducive for them to attract a bug called the azalea lace bug. Right. And um, it can kind of cause them to have a silvery kind of appearance mm-hmm. from far away. When you get up close, there's stifling. And so that can be an issue if they're in a sunny location. So make sure they're getting enough shade. I'm sure you probably have some things to add. Yeah, those are good. I think you just about covered it. But I've seen a lot in the landscape here in Shelby County, azaleas in the wrong conditions. Mm. Uh, the afternoon sun here is just too hot for your azaleas. They need to be in the shade. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, if they're going to be out in the sun, they're going to be stressed out. Yep. If they're stressed out, then guess what? Here comes the azalea lace bug, like you mentioned. Again, bug named after a plant. Yeah. So here we go with that again, <laughs> azalea, azalea lace bugs. Uh, so you have to be careful with that, Mr. Joe. And, um, hey, make sure you go out and inspect. Fertility, again, may be an issue, pH, whatever. Mm-hmm. Come by the... You know, extension office, you know. They like acidic soils. Like acidic so. soils. You can test your soils. Come by and let us give you a soil kit so you can get that done. Um, but I think if you do all of that, then you'll be just fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So here's our next question. How do I kill a small amount of clover in my fescue line without harming the grass itself? And this is from Mr. David. So he wants <clears throat> to kill the clover in his fescue line Mm -hmm. without killing the fescue. Right. So what do you think about that one? Well, as far as uh, chemical applications, I'll cover that part. Um, We, you're going to want to use a um, a selective herbicide and that means it is going to selectively kill broadleaf weeds and it's not going to harm the grass and it'll be fine for uh, cool season grasses like fescue. You're going to want to use something that has active ingredient of 2,4-D or there are some three-way chemicals out there that Mm -hmm. also contain Usually 2,4-D, um, <clears throat> dicamba, dicamba yeah. or mepicrop, and there are some other combinations out there. But something along those lines would take care of it as far as the chemical applications go. Right. And then, you know, I'm going to hit the cultural practices. Yeah. I always like to go to that. Healthy, dense stand of grass would mm-hmm. actually help ward out weeds for the most part. And if you think about clover, Celeste, clover actually produces nitrogen from the atmosphere, mm-hmm. from the air. So the reason why it is there is because it has to produce its own nitrogen to be there, Mm -hmm. which means your site has poor fertility. Uh, Yeah. Right. So pH. Mm -hmm. Okay. So get your soil tested, figure out what your pH is, fertilize according to the soil test. Okay. And then from there, you have to mow at the right height, of course, uh, proper irrigation, and again, proper fertilization. And I think you'll be fine with that, Mr. David. I think that'll work. But yeah, using, if you have to use the chemical, the three ways do work. Mm-hmm. You know, broadleaf weed killers, and that will get the job done. Even in your fescue. Right? Even in the fescue. Even in the fescue. Read the label. Always read, read the label. Read the label. I'm glad you mentioned that. Always read the label. That's right. <clears throat> okay, here's our next question. <clears throat> uh, what is the best way to control tomato blight? I had a big problem with it last year. And this is Mr. Jimmy. So he mm-hmm. had a problem with tomato blight last year. Mm-hmm. He didn't want us to have the blight this year. Okay. 
Here's the thing about tomato black, okay? You know, to me, again, maybe four or five things come to mind. Mm -hmm. If you would mulch your tomatoes, you would cut down on the soil splashing Splash effect up. because it's gonna, if you don't have the mulch, it rains, you water, Splashes up, lower leaves are going to get the spores first, and mm -hmm. then guess what happens? It flares up the rest of the tomato plant throughout the summer. And the old timers call it firing it up. Firing up. That's firing what they call it. it. That's exactly what they call <laughs> it. So if you put the mulch down, that'll work. Something else I recommend, staking, because mm -hmm. you want to get those leaves and the fruit off the ground. Off the ground. Okay. Another thing is this, crop rotation. That's what I was going to say, okay. crop rotation. You don't want to put the tomatoes in the same place year after mm -hmm. year after year. Because nope. it's getting in the soil and it's not Because it's in moving. the soil. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. It's in the soil. Okay. Another thing is get rid of that old crop debris. Because mm -hmm. okay? I see that in a lot of gardens. Yeah. People just, you know, plant Leave right it. there. They think that it's helping improve the organic matter. Mm -hmm. And if you've got, it does. It if does. Your plants mm -hmm. aren't diseased. That's right. They're not right. diseased. So. Yeah. And the last thing I could think of is, you know, check to see if there are any resistant varieties out there. Yeah. There, right. And there are some resistant varieties, right. but it's going to be hard to avoid that in our area yeah. just because we've got those ideal conditions. All right, Celeste, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Appreciate Thanks that. for having me. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. If you would like more information on mixing fertilizer or laying side, go to familyplotgarden.com. You can rewatch any part of the show and read extension publications about that topic. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe.